Hollywood, welcome to Starlight Mystery Theater and another episode in the series, Matthew Slade, Private Investigator. We invite you to take your seat as Matthew Slade unfolds The Secret Gray Man. In my job, the hours are odd. So are the circumstances and the people I meet. You could even call some of them dangerous. My calling card reads, Matthew Slade, private investigator. Time, 12 a.m. Place, my apartment. The lights were low. Soft music playing. Flames from the fireplace reflected in two brandy glasses. The setting was perfect. The company... Divine, Matthew. Simply divine. The apartment is so soothing. All right. Wasn't that the doorbell? Yes. Were you expecting anyone? Only my grandmother. She drops by every evening with a fresh case of root beer. Matt Slade? Yeah, right. Special delivery letter. Sign here, please. Thank you. Who's it from? Granny? Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way. Business, Mr. Slade? Business. Well, I am sympathetic understanding, and willing to make sacrifices for a rain track. Mm. Good night. I'll let myself out. The letter was from Gray Durant, and it was in code. I'd met the secret Gray man, Durant's tag in cloak and dagger circles in Korea. Gray was G2, one of four men assigned to top secret work. The code was born there, worked out one night before Gray, I, and two other men, Sanderson and Rogers, went across the lines. It was involved and was a one-for-all agreement. One of those things that men do when they know they're going to die. The slender thread to luck. Sanderson and Rogers were killed. Gray and I had never invoked the agreement until now. I burned the note, threw my toothbrush and an extra cylinder of cartridges into a suitcase, and headed for my car. I drove along the coast toward Morro Bay. Gray lived in what he called his castle. The place overlooked the bay and seemed carved out of the cliff. The huge rock in the ocean, Morro Bay's landmark, was more noticeable and more accessible. Gray was still cloak and dagger. If the letter meant what I thought it did, he could be dead. A filling station loomed ahead on the highway. I wheeled the Continental under the pump area. Yes, sir. That shall fill her up? Yeah, yeah. You got a phone? A telephone booth around the side. Thanks. Second step in the agreement, contact before approaching. Customary precaution. Gray? Who is this? Matt Slade. I got the letter. Are you in trouble? Well, maybe no. I didn't send it. Sanderson or Rogers? They're dead, Matt. Yeah, someone else. A nice setup for a kill. Don't sweat it, man. Will you follow? I've been so busy playing Superman, I didn't notice. Gray, where shall we meet? Is that a trap for my killer? Well, I can set it up alone. It was my goof. We'll go together. There's a motel called the Glass House on Morrow Bay. Registered. I'm known in the village. So we'll dig into the handy-dandy disguise kit. Code contact will be Marcy. Marcy, yeah. The glass house, uh, isn't there something about people who live on rocks shouldn't build glass houses? You killed me, Matt. I hope not, Gray. I hope not. I walked back to the car. The man was standing beside it, peering inside. He was back East New York type, sharply dressed. I tightened inside. This your car? Yeah. Got one just like it. 
Over there. Pointed toward what could have been the Continental's twin, except his had a blonde inside. Uh, my wife. Honey, it's Mr. Slade. I uh, read your registration. My name's Herbert Edwards. Herbie! Do you have to talk to every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the highway? Uh, nice talking to you, Slade. <laughs> I headed toward Morro Bay, keeping an eye on the rearview mirror. No one was following me, at least no one that I could spot. I reached the glass house, its three stories, a thousand eyes blinking at the sea. I registered, took the elevator up. The room looked all right, wasn't bugged, so my unknown killer was behind me somewhere. I finished a pack of cigarettes and decided to get some sleep. Morning came, but not too soon. I dressed, went downstairs to the desk. No, no, Mr. Slade, no messages. You came in late last night, I see. Oh, are we having a brunch at the pool this morning? Uh, is that the custom? Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, the sea air is so, uh, mm, appetizing. Yes, well, we'll have brunch at the pool. Hmm? Uh, the pool is on your right. Oh, don't walk through the glass doors. Uh, that can be nasty. Finding the pool was no problem. I remembered not to walk through the glass doors. I edged over legs and arms in various degrees of sunburn, looking for someone who might resemble Gray. People in bathing suits resemble other people, never themselves. A waiter appeared, ushered me to a table near the diving board where a group of teenagers were playing water tag. He took my order. By the time my scrambled eggs arrived, I was soaked to the skin. A waiter, could you find me a table a little further back from the pool? Yes, sir. Don't move. I was just getting up enough courage to speak to you. Her voice indicated that she was gorgeous. I turned for a good look. She was. What I could see of her. I belong to the Cotton States Journal. Over there. She indicated a seersucker suit. The character in it smiled blearily, raised his scotch in a passing bikini. But he likes me to be friendly. I couldn't catch all she said because I had noticed a charm bracelet with Marcy in chunk-sized letters. Uh, I'm very friendly, too. Mm, that's wonderful. Oh! oh. What, what's wrong? You got a cramp? She nodded and slowly disappeared into the water, and I went in after her. The girl is wrong. Okay, now you're all right. I, I've got you. Here, let me help you. Uh, she's all right now. She's all right. Oh, hold on. Uh, here, just let her go. She's all right. Uh, let me... Let me uh, hey, Slade, it's Edward. Old Herbie Edward. Yeah, well, will you let go of her, please? Sure, sure. Hey, imagine running into you over here. Yeah, well, I just let me get her up the steps, will right, you? Right, okay. Okay, I'll put, put her over there. Now, now, keep back, folks. Herbie, do you have to get involved in that one What in the world is it going on here? Somebody trying to drown my little gal? It was gray, southern accent, pot belly, and beard. She almost drowned. Slade here saved her. Well, Mr. Slade, I surely do. Thank you. Now, I want to repay you. Big Charlie Winston don't let things just go by. Now, if you folks will let us through. Gray, Marcy, and I sloshed our way through the lobby. It took 20 minutes to change clothes and get to Gray's suite. I knocked. Marcy opened the door, grinned at me, and then locked it after I entered. You didn't spot me. Yeah, that's quite a get-up you're wearing, Big Charlie. Anyone tried to contact you? No, no, but Edwards thought he might... Edwards? Give... The other clown in the pool who was trying to save yeah, me. Yeah, the one I ran into, uh, Edwards and his wife, on the way down here. Ever seen him before, or her? No, I can't tie them in anywhere, but there's... There's a possibility. Where's this leave us? Out on a limb. Mr. or Miss Unknown knows about the agreement. How, we will figure out later. But they know. They know about the call. So, around 5.30, see what gives for the cocktail crop. <laughs> I slid onto a seat in the bar and glanced around. The terrace dining room was crowded. There were a few couples on the dance floor. None looked in a killing mood or even interesting until... Martinis aren't really unhealthy, are they? I mean, I'm not likely to get something horrible if I keep drinking them, am I? She was young and beautiful and maybe lonesome, which I doubted. Maybe something else. Like developing an allergy to olives or well, something? that depends. How many of you have? <laughs> This place is pretty dull. It should start to liven up soon. Oh, it has. I'm Lisa Albert. Who are you? Matt Slade. What do you do, Matt? Uh, I'm a private investigator. Are you private investigating now? No, no. Vacation. You? Vacation. From here to L.A., to Mexico City, to Honolulu. Mm. 
Poor little rich girl? Poor little poor girl. Secretary from Sacramento who saved her money for... For one big kick. Right? One big husband hunting expedition. Oh. Want to marry me now or later? Uh, would you like to dance? Coward. I'd love to. Lisa felt good. Perhaps too good. In my arms. She danced well. Easily. Over her shoulder I saw Gray in his Captain Andy disguise come in with Marcy. He looked about the bar, then headed for the terrace, Marcy following. Then he spotted us on the dance floor and started toward us. I could feel Lisa's back muscles tighten briefly, then... Well, now, Mr. Slade, you're doing all right by yourself, son. I thought you were a stranger here. Introduce me to the lovely little lady. Um, Lisa Albers, this is Marcy and Big this... Charlie Winston, <laughs> mighty pleased. Now, you stop stepping on her pretty feet, Slade, and both of you come and join us for dinner. Gray led the way to a table, one which gave him a full view of the dining area and the bar and ordered for all of us. Proceeded to charm Lisa out of her life story. She had reached the age of 18 when we were interrupted by... Slade, Herbie Edwards. You remember, honey. Don't get up. I just wanted to say how much I admired what you did this afternoon. And buy a drink for all of you. Everybody likes a hero. Sit down, Edwards. Now, honey, you, you, you sit over here. Gray was playing his role to the hilt, but he was suspicious of Edwards. So was I. Gray and Edwards babbled on, with Gray leading the conversation. Marcy tried talking to Honey, but uh, Honey just didn't like to talk. Lisa was quiet. I glanced at her. She seemed to be no more than what she had said. Then... Listen, everybody, I would like to contribute something. I know a crazy little place called the Cave, very avant-garde. I invite all of you to be my guests. On a secretary's salary? Please. That's the best little old idea I've heard all evening. Come on, let's go. Call old Herbie and Honey in. We'll take my car. Why don't we take Matt's car? Uh, you do have one, don't you? Lisa raised her eyebrows at old Herbie, who would have had trouble finding his car, much less driving it. I nodded to her, and we trooped toward the parking lot. As we reached it... Oh, Don, wait for me. Please, I forgot something. Oh, what is it? I'll go. No, no, it'll only take a minute. Just pull the car around to the front. Lisa ran back inside the hotel as we piled into my car, and then discovered that my keys were in the suit I had so hastily shed. I started to go back for them, but Edwards protested. We'll take my car, and I'll drive. Well, I'm not that drunk, old friends. Edwards got out and headed for his car, which was about 50 feet away. You can count on old Herbie. The front of Edwards' car disappeared in smoke. Stunned, we all ran toward the car. I reached the car, dragged Edwards clear. He was badly hurt, but still alive. An ambulance took Herbie away, honey with him. What happened to Lisa? Gray? Matt? Uh, I, I don't know. Surely she heard the explosion. The sirens. And, and she didn't come back. She didn't intend to come back. Lisa isn't the one behind it. There's someone else. There's one point you masterminds are forgetting. Edward's car had the bomb. Not Matt's. Cars looked alike. Was it a mistake? A killer wouldn't make a mistake. Unless uh, Lisa wanted him to. Come on, Matt. What are you selling? And she wanted us to take my car, remember? Not Edward's. And she thought we were. Look at my registration, Gray. Herbert Edwards, 624 Willowbrook. She switched. The I stopped to ask the desk clerk if Lisa Albers had checked out. Lisa had never checked in. When I reached Gray's suite, he was standing at the window with a pair of binoculars. Marcy was curled in the corner of the couch watching him. Gray handed me the binoculars. Look, beyond the rock in the bay. Yeah. Okay, okay. What am I looking for? A yacht. 50-footer. Well lighted. About halfway. There. Yeah, got it. I don't see anyone on board. She's riding low. Yeah. I can see that bay from my house, Matt. I keep an eye on ships coming in and out. I know most of them. I don't know that one, the Moonstone. Yeah, go on. The Moonstone showed up the morning you received the letter. No one came near her. No one left her. Until, Until you got my call. Right. After you called a woman, left the boat in a dinghy. I think that woman was Lisa. Now, come on now, Gray, you're reaching. Maybe. I want to go out there and find out. Are you game? Yeah, how do we go? Boat, bus, plane? We drive out to the rock and then swim. I have scuba suits in the car. Now, you're not going to take Marcy, are you? 
I'm not going to leave her here for him to find. Come on, let's go. Gray drove along the road leading to the rock, then parked the car in a deserted section. We donned the frogman suits and slipped into the water. The boat looked far away. I had the underwater torch. Marcy and Gray were ahead of me in the water, their heads bobbing. To an observer, we would appear to be seals, we hoped. As we neared the moonstone, I listened for voices of someone on board. I heard nothing. I followed Gray and Marcy around the bow silently. Gray beckoned to me, pointed to a spot just above the water line. I flashed the torch briefly, long enough to see a nice splintered hole, man-made. The dinghy was gone. I saw a rope dangling, reached for it, scrambled aboard, crouched in the shadows listening. It was silent. Light streamed from the open cabin door. I went toward it. Gray was right behind me. He had a gun. Mine was tucked easily where I could reach it. I started down the cabin way, a thousand icy spiders crawling down my back. Then, I saw her. What is it? Lisa. Lisa. She was crumpled against the bunk, her head angled up. She moved slightly, saw us. Matt? Don't try to move, Lisa. I knelt down, cupped her head in my hands. Her hair was wet, sticky, with blood. Gray stood silently, cursing. He thought I was dead. The four of you made an agreement in Korea. No, no, don't, don't try to talk. One of them is still alive. Yeah, yeah. Which one? I'm sorry, Matt. I didn't know what he was going to do. It's all right, Lisa. We'll get you off. We'll get you a doctor. Gray helped me lift her. It was very light. Water was rising on the cabin floor. Gray turned to glance around. Leave it. There's nothing here. We've got to get her off. She's dead. Leave her here, Matt. Gray took her from my arms, put her on the bunk. I looked at her, wondering why she had to die like this. Then Gray took my arm, pulled me up the cabin way. Marcy was waiting for us. Automatically, numbly, I followed Gray and Marcy over the side. We swam quickly away. Then saw the boat as its lights flickered, went out, and the water sucked it down slowly. How could he just... You don't mind if I cry, do you? We all need someone to cry for us sometime. Sanderson or Rogers? But you said they were both dead. You saw them die. No, we saw them hit. We saw them fall. We thought they were dead. We were all expendable, Marcy, and we knew it. If only one man got back alive. We didn't stop to make sure, Marcy. We couldn't. We reported them missing, later dead. Now one of them is too late alive. Well, we can't check the boat's registry tonight, so So we... So we draw him out. Right. On the drive back, we outlined a plan. We reached the hotel. I went to my car, checked for superfluous wiring. There was none. Gray, parked across the highway, blinked his headlights once, indicating he'd seen me. I started the car and turned onto the highway. I drove slowly, Gray staying a good half mile behind. Traffic was slow. Several cars passed, but none stayed with me. I reached the turnoff to Gray's estate, made the turn, then started up the hill to his private road. I kept watching the rearview mirror. When I was halfway up, I saw headlights make the turn. The gates to the estate were open. Looked back for the lights. They had disappeared. Gray had given me the key to the front door. I had trouble fitting it into the lock. Then... Then I felt someone behind me. What's wrong? The key. Feel it. Graphite. He's already inside. Where's Marcy? Right here. She knows what to do. Go ahead, Matt. Just give me five minutes cover. Marcy and Gray became part of the shadows. I put the key in the lock, turned it, and entered the house. It was dark, but I knew from Gray's briefing that I was in an entry hall. I crouched. I ran for the drawing room. I straightened and stood just inside the door, waiting. Quite a show, Matt. What does Gray call this place? The house of lights? Hold it, buddy, right there. I swiveled toward the sound of his voice, but he had moved. The cold, empty hole of a revolver was pressed against the back of my neck. So I held it. Now you turn around, son, and you put your hands against that wall. Higher. How many minutes did Gray give you for this razzle-dazzle with me? Five? One to go. Sanderson. Oh, baby, what a memory. 
Yeah, Sanderson, but not so dead, huh? You should have made sure. Yeah, well, this time, Sanderson, baby, you went over the lines, huh? Mm-hmm, well, all the goodies, buddy, all that classified info. I, um, uh, what is that nasty word? I, uh, deserted. No, <laughs> defected. Uh, you don't approve? No. I didn't think you would. Neither would our big hero, the secret gray man. You're both too, um... Why don't you try square? Fits in with your philosophy. Huh. What happened? They sending you back on a goodwill tour? Uh-huh. They said, Sandy, baby, go spread words of joy to those poor, lost Americans. Yeah. Guess who I saw when I hit Frisco? Old buddy Matt Slade. True blue and honest Indian Slade. And then I learned another old buddy, Gray Durant, was on the coast. My orders? Eliminate the Bobsy twin. Yeah, how'd you find out where Gray lived? Oh, well, I just called the CIA and asked. <laughs> You kidding? We got boys on your side of the street, too. What about Lisa? Oh, Lisa. Oh, I moan for Lisa. She dug the Nathan Hale of Morrow Baby. I'm enjoying your story, Sanderson, but if we're playing Wipeout, let's play. No, we're going to wait for Daddy Gray. Yeah. You've been playing Bird Dog ever since I sent that letter. And poor Lisa, she was dumb, man, dumb. She couldn't spot the gray man. He wasn't Edwards. Well, that leaves the jolly southern planter. All right, come on out, Corn Pone, wherever you are. You guessed wrong. Now, you don't lie to me, Matt. I've cased this place, baby. It's full of gimmicks. Hidden panels, the whole bit. He's right over there. See, boy? See that moonlight shimmering and shining on that painting? We're right behind it. It's a monk's room. A secret room for the secret gray man. And watch me aim for the eyes. Hold it steady, Matt. I got two hands and two guns. You still alive, gray man? Watch me get old buddy boy here. Suddenly, all hell broke loose. The room came quiet with light. I was blinded. So was Sanderson. The shot came from the window, thudded into the wall beside me. I jumped for Sanderson as he turned to fire at the window. I hit him hard, <clears throat> trying for the guns. He hit his stomach with his elbow, slammed me back against a marble coffee table. I twisted aside, but he caught the edge of the table with his chin. Well, that was it. Ah, where in blazes were you? Temper, Cassius Temper, in the monk's room. I'll be digging plaster out of my face for weeks. Yeah, well, it looks good on you. Sort of Van Gogh effect. And Marcy fired that shot, huh? Yeah, she's not much of a shot. She almost got you. So, the secret gray man remained alive. And secret. Sanderson was happy to talk about his colleagues and their activities. As he said, his heart belonged to America. I headed home for San Francisco. As I passed the giant crouching rock in Morro Bay... I thought of Korea and the four men crouching in a giant shadow of death and wondered if the agreement, that slender thread to luck, was not, after all, the thread which led to death and to near death for the secret gray man. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.